And good morning, my name is Susan Fisher Owens. I'm a pediatrician and a member of the faculty at UCSF and San Francisco General and the School of Dentistry at UCSF. And I'm here today outside of clinic, had to cancel patients this morning so that I could be with you to talk about something that is so important to me in my daily practice. And that's the role of oral health in systemic health. So I do have, as an academic, I must have my disclaimers. I have my disclaimers, no real money in this. Uh, and that I will be discussing something off-label. As my fellow pediatrician knows, we in pediatrics do almost everything off-label. So that really doesn't make us sweat much. Um, but we have objectives, but I also have only 20 minutes. So I'm going to dive right into it and talk about what this role is. Because I think, you know, I was looking at this last night. Since 1840, when the first dental school was built, dentistry and medicine has been separated. And so, but I care about this because this affects my patients. When, uh, you know, and, and many people say, well, you're a pediatrician. Why, why, don't, why isn't there a dentist talking to us? But it's my patients. And I could tell you many, many stories, but for the purpose of time, I'll tell you about just one. And this was a young lady who I saw in my general pediatrician role, seeing them in a post-hospital follow-up. She was a young lady with a seizure disorder. And I knew that she had been admitted to the hospital for increased seizures. They didn't know why. They tried an EEG. They tried changing her medicines. They tried all these different things. And her seizures didn't stop. So finally, they said, well, we're not doing anything for her anyways. So let's send her home. And I saw her in hospital follow-up, just a general head-to-toe exam like I always do. And I found a whopping dental abscess that this young woman had had, had been missed by every physician who had seen her in the hospital. And she wasn't having seizures. She was rigoring with pain. She was shaking with so much pain that she had and that we had missed the opportunity to care for her. So these are my patients. And I could tell a dozen stories like this. But for the purpose of moving on, we'll just mention that patients see their medical provider, their nurses, their public health people much more often than they see their dentists. They may see us, 99% of patients who see both see the medicine provider first. On average, they only see, they, on average, they see the medical provider 10 times before they see a dentist. So by the time they get to the dentist, it's too late. We've missed that preventive window, which can be done in our office and can be done to support the work that you all are doing with your patients. Because already by the time kids are five, by the time they, before they even hit kindergarten, a quarter of them have caries, have dental caries. And that's too much. This is a disease that does not need to be this bad. I show you this slide just as a graphic representation. This top line is the rate of dental caries as compared to asthma, hay fever, chronic bronchitis. It is the most common chronic disease of childhood. And no pediatrician in our right mind would say, oh, I'm not going to deal with asthma. It's not that bad of a problem. Oh, I'm not going to deal with hay fever. It's not that common. This is five to seven times more common than that. So how does it not fall into our field to work together to support our kids? Because it's not just about having a pain in your tooth. It affects a multitude of issues for a child's health. Children's nutrition actually is somewhat of a U-shaped curve. We find kids with bad oral health either don't eat well at all because it just hurts too much, and we actually see them failing to thrive, not growing well. On the other extreme, we also see these kids are much more likely to have obesity because those foods that they can eat are the concentrated, complex, car uh, simple carbohydrates that make us overweight and don't support our health. That then translates into pain. It's an issue of pain where a, a, almost 20% of emergency room visits for kids are for non-traumatic dental problems. So these are problems that could be managed in other environments. Instead, it's clogging up our emergency rooms. It's costing more money to care for them. And it's meaning those kids are spending late nights at the emergency room. So they're not getting home. They're not doing their homework. They're not sleeping. Or they miss school the next day because they were up so late at night being tired and in pain. That school issue translates again to the impact on a child. If a child doesn't go to school, how are they going to move ahead? We know these kids are one third less likely to graduate from high school. 
for the sake of having oral health problems. So it's a direct impact on that child. It also is the indirect impact on kids around them. You know, as you all know, in California, we are funded in our schools by having kids in class. And if a child is missing a day of school, they're getting get paid less in the following year. For that school will be, will be reimbursed less. And we know that kids who have oral health problems are more likely to cluster, which means also these schools are less likely to be reinvested in year after year when they're the ones that perhaps need it the most of all. So we have direct effects. We have the effect on graduation. We have effect on that child and the effect on our school districts. So these are huge impacts to a child and a child's overall health. Now, not graduating from school leads us into having troubles in adulthood. Now, the, the biggest likelihood of having problems with adult teeth is having problems in child's, children's teeth. So the first step is if we can prevent it in kids, we can prevent it down the line as well and have that ripple effect. But moreover, it has an issue of employability. If one doesn't graduate from high school, it's harder to get a good job and sustain and give back to the community the way so many of you are doing by being here and caring about helping kids. It also actually impacts the ability to be hired. They've done studies where they show people with a full set of dentition and people with partial dentition, but having identical resumes. And the ones with a clear smile are more likely to be hired, even if their qualifications are the same. So it again impacts their ability to provide and sustain and, and contribute to their community. The last piece I'll add to that is an interesting one, I think, from the California National Guard. And they found, they did a study with the California National Guard, and you can have differences of opinion on how you feel about the National Guard, but I think we can all agree that these are, by, by definition, these are young, healthy people who want to contribute, right? 40% of people who tried to apply to the California National Guard were turned away because their oral health was so bad, the National Guard didn't want to take the responsibility of taking care of them to fix their mouth to make them healthy enough to be able to serve. And these are people who want to contribute. So why aren't we doing more to help them do that? And that can be done in our environment. A couple quick other pieces about the impact on adult health, um, and I wish I could go into these in great detail, but for just the highlights, there are huge impacts with systemic health and oral health in adults. We know, and there's some interesting research on this, uh, but that babies are more likely to bo be born with low birth weight or premature. Premature, excuse me. There's higher rates of cardiovascular disease incidence in adults who have oral health problems, Cardio higher rates of stroke, higher rates of problems with diabetes and complications from diabetes. You know, a little problem like diabetes that we see in more than a third of all of our patients, and an even greater cost than that to our healthcare system. Um, and recent work has come out about the impacts on dementia and increasing the rate of dementia and the severity of dementia with oral health problems. One that's so new I didn't even get it on my slide is also end-stage renal disease and more likely to progress to needing transplant because of their renal disease with poor oral health. So huge implications on our systemic health. Now, as just a quick little plug to my fellow medical providers, it's also a law. So here in California, the Department of Health and Human Service requires Medi-Cal insurers to provide oral health services. So we should be doing it, but well, there's also a bit of a stick out there if we're not. But so what can we do? Where do we go with this? I like to, I like to end this by saying we are preventionists as primary care providers, as medical providers. We try to prevent obesity by counseling about about nutrition, we try to prevent disease by counseling around vaccines, and so we can prevent the most common chronic condition of childhood by doing work in our clinics. So how? We'll get to that in one second, but first I wanted just to have a quick highlight on fluoride because I know that's an issue up here, and there are a lot of myths out there as well as some truths. So real quickly, there are four mechanisms that fluoride has to strengthen teeth. 
It works mostly through the saliva and the plaque. It's system uh, it, more than systemically. It works topically in the mouth. And there are natural sources. And I mention this to you because whenever issues are raised about fluoride as being contaminating our water, it is a natural part of our water. It is naturally in water and some food and some drinks. It can be in community fluoridated water at the appropriate levels. We add it in to help keep our populations healthy. It can also be in toothpaste, but that can range anywhere from having no fluoride and sugar, the exact opposite of what we want in fluoride, all the way up to a prescription level. And then it can also be in different forms that can be applied in the medical and dental office. Now, these are the opposite of what we want. Sugar sweetened, huge amounts that would last months worth of toothpaste. Um, and in fact, you almost hope these don't have fluoride because these are the ones kids are more likely to eat and actually get an excess of fluoride because that is a real issue in limited cases. For those of you who aren't aware of fluorosis, which is what the anti-fluoridationists talk about, I give you this slide, as a gra this graphic to show you. This is representing 100 children, 100 sets of teeth. And the last two, in the bottom right, you can see are brown and speckled. Those are, that's severe fluorosis. And that is a weaker tooth, as are the two to the left of that, which is mild fluorosis. The eight before that, that actually look white and shiny, what people pay a lot of money to aspire to, is mild fluorosis. And mild fluorosis actually strengthens the teeth and makes it look whiter. Um, it's only in the most severe cases that it weakens the tooth. And these are most commonly in the US from cases where there's an either overconsumption of toothpaste or natural well water that is above the levels it should be. But community water fluoridation, what we hope to have in our community water, and three quarters of you here in Marin have access to it, is can cause a 25% disease reduction alone in, the impact, in, in dental caries in children. Um, it saves money for the amount invested in it. And there's some great talking points um, for you as a reference for later. This, this, this website, I Like My Teeth, is actually a pro-fluoridation website to help balance some of the negative pieces that are coming out on social media. Bottled water is pre predominant uh, pre in our communities now. Um, and many people go to it because they think it's healthier. Um, it may or may not contain fluoride. Some forms of bottled water actually are bottled from municipal sources with community water fluoridation, so then you get it. But it's not always clear, and you don't always know without a lot of research. The, the unfortunate piece is it's more commonly consumed by patients who are at the highest risk. So for instance, my patients at the general, who are more likely to have come from other communities, or 100% of our patients are below poverty level, they are more likely to drink bottled water because they think that's safer. Many of them have either come from countries where that was the safer piece to drink, um, and they're doing it because they want to do right by their kids. But it's actually much more expensive and less healthy for them. So this is a piece about which we can counsel. So ending on a scary note from the anti-fluoridationists, they say, public notice, please be advised, sodium fluoride, found in most bottle tap waters and foods, kills rodents, causes cancer, lowers your IQ, causes apathy, is used by Nazis, and is in your water. Now, hopefully the last one is true, but actually none of the rest are. And good research has proven, disproven all of the other points. And even the National Holocaust Museum, not generally a pro-Nazi organization, doesn't say that they used fluoride when they, they, they did water fluoridation uh, to effect. So instead, the top, health top 100 health organizations from around our country and the world agree that it is safe and one of the top 10 public health interventions of the last century. So let's now move from the global, more global to the more local and come in, step into my office, step into where in the medical world we can support oral health. You first just get to know what cute little teeth look like. It's a fun part of our job. And when we examine them, to examine the mouth. Uh, when I started in training, they didn't even have a place, where, a checkbox where I could talk about the mouth. 
on my physical exam forms. And now it's a part of what we want all documentation to be. But as that to actually lift the lip, if you look um, here, uh, just at the top rim on these sweet little teeth, that's actually the start of early caries. So if you just tell the patient to open their mouth, the lips may get in the way of seeing that there's already a problem there that we can do something about. So what can we do? We can advance the slide. And when we advance the slide, uh, we'll get to know about fluoride varnish a little bit. Can you, yeah, there we go. So here we go, to advance, to go into fluoride varnish. Fluoride varnish is a concentrated resin of fluoride that sets on contact with the application to the teeth. It is easy to apply. I used to say it's easier than putting on nail polish and then I realized that half the population doesn't wear nail polish. Um, more, give or take. So I actually taught my then five-year-old to apply it. And so I now tell people, if you have the skills of a five-year-old, you can apply fluoride varnish, okay? And so it's something that we can easily integrate into our clinics. It is a valuable piece that we can talk about more at another time, but that it can be applied in less than a minute and can drop, as you saw there, it can drop the rate of disease by between 37 and 50% just by, and particularly with repeated doses, the more the better. Um, now, for those who are concerned about the more the better and the fluoride that we talked about before, um, Dr. Pollock and some others in the audience and I have just worked on a paper saying even up to nine times a year, we can apply it so it's safe to get it in the dental office as well as in the primary care office. So it, has a real, it's a savings for us. Actually, it's one of the few things in medicine that doesn't cost more than what it takes, that we get paid to do it. So the cost of the supplies are around a dollar and we can be reimbursed up to $18 for each application. And that saves money to the healthcare system and it saves our patients, these impacts on systemic health, which I've mentioned before. And most of all, important to know in our busy lives, it's not hard to integrate into the workflow. So there are different ways we can integrate. Uh, the traditional model is a doctor sits on my perch and makes a referral and says, go forth and do what I say. And we find that's very ineffective. Uh, you know, we maybe get a little bit more than saying nothing, but it really doesn't get there. We can have co-location. In the ideal world, places like, I, I heard a couple of you were at FQHCs, and those FQs can have the medical office and the dental office in the same location. But it's more than being co-located, it's really about the integration and getting people to cross the hallway to get to make that next appointment. Um, we did a, a sample in San Francisco at one of the FQs and less than 40% of patients made it across the hall. So being there isn't enough. You need to talk about it, you need to encourage it, you need to check back. Now, some practices around the country are embedding dental hygienists into the medical practice as a way of making it work. Um, and so there's different ways, but the key, what we're doing here in Marin, I'm so excited to hear, is looking at integration and saying, how can we integrate our medical and our dental providers and our public health providers and our nursing and our pharmacists? How can we work together to support the health of our community? Um, so one example of that is our, pra our project we did at the General, which is very similar to your FQs, where it's of um, a high uh, racial ethnic composition with, with our, we're basically 100% low socioeconomic status. And this was what our patients looked like at baseline. Um, so with hugely, huge amounts of risk or actual disease already. And what's been amazing, we started with just doing referrals and found out how ineffective that was alone. Um, we in actually embedded a dentist into our practice for a while, one half day a week, but what about the patients who were there the other 90% of the time? We were missing them. And that's when we took our phase three where we recentered it in pediatrics, put our education into our nurses and our doctor's hands, and added the fluoride varnish as a preventive piece that's just a part of what we do, just like we give vaccines, we give fluoride varnish. Um, with, I'm proud to say, great impact. Um, I won't spend too much time bragging about that because I'm coming close on my time, but now over 80% of our well child visits are a, have fluoride varnish given, just integrated into the visit. Um, the other piece that we do in our practice is the counseling. And the counseling, this is not extra work. 
because the counseling you give to kids who are eating like this or looking like that, when they open their mouth, that's what you see. And so the piece about saying about healthy eating and healthy activity can also have impact on your teeth. And a lot of times our families don't even know that they can impact, that, that it's not inevitable to have a lifetime of pain or missing teeth. And we can help give them that gift. We also can use other people's work. So taking advantage of pieces that have been put out about the fluoride varnish to add counseling for handouts patients can take home. Because we're working to this model, the model of if you can even brush your dog's teeth, why are we not doing this for our children? Why are we not helping them stay healthy? So with that, I say this is not the end. You've got a great network here, but you get in what you get, what you get out what you put in. So all of you being here together today and committing to working with each other for the health of your community, you've got your local champions, you've got the public health department, and you've got an opportunity to move forward to a better future for children, children and adults of Marin. So with that, I give a couple training opportunities and my name. We'll deal with questions later, but I want to thank you now and again for the fact that you're working to help this community. So thank you very much for your time. That was the most information in the shortest amount of time I think we've ever had. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the enthusiasm is wonderful. And uh, uh, I wanted to just step back a little bit and welcome everyone to the Marin Communications Forum. Uh, this is sponsored by First Five Marin. And I just wanted to, to make a note. Um, when I first started with First Five about 13, 14 years ago, um, we were funding the Children's Oral Health Project for $150,000 a year, I believe. And that helped um, fund getting the uh, uh, dental hygienists out into the community and doing all of the uh, checks at preschool and daycare, um, which allowed some documentation about, some early documentation about what the need was. And since then, the county has invested in oral health. We've seen um, so many chairs that were installed in the Marin community clinics and a lot of work being done. And so with today, with the new needs assessment and the county strategic plan, we're really looking forward to, um, to moving forward, improving oral health for all, and uh, working in partnership. And <clears throat> on the point about uh, the connection between oral health and overall health, since we um, heard the doctor's story about, about um, missing an abscess or missing an oral health problem. When I first began in, um, doing some uh, work and writing about this, um, there was an item in the news at that time, and it was a very tragic story of a child in Maryland who had oral health issues, and because of moving across county and even state lines because of the, the states close together there from Maryland to Virginia and back to different communities, different counties, having some precarious housing, people lost track of him. So the follow-up didn't happen as well. And unfortunately, he had a, a mouth infection which traveled to his brain and he died. This was a four-year-old child um, and eight-year-old child, thank you. Obviously, it's a famous story. But that really, really hit me for not um, being in the field and not um, realizing that, how, how the big connection between oral health and overall health. So thanks, everyone, for what you do for our children. We'll continue on. Dr. Silverstein, thank you. So there should be one slide. Oh, there it is. This is my only PowerPoint. Uh, so that's me up here. I'm a longtime Marin County resident for a lot of years. And this is just a, a wonderful day to be present for the rollout of the Marin County Oral Health Plan. That's a long time in coming. Uh, so I've been in the, on the Marin County Oral Health Access Committee again for a long time. In 2014, we had a little money, I think, I don't know where it came, maybe it came from First Five, to do oral health plan. Uh, 
that was kind of brushed over. Uh, the thing that was lacking, what I criticized it, there was no part of it for a community-based dental disease prevention activity. It was all focused on access to care. So here we come, uh, was it three to four years later, and we have funding from Prop 56 tobacco tax money. $30 million went to the state oral health plan. So each of the 61 health districts in California received funding. This is public health money. It is not treatment money. It is not health services money. It's like tobacco control money. It's public health money. So this is what Marin received, I think about $250,000 a year for five years. And as long as people keep vaping, smoking, et cetera, this will continue for a long time. So back when I started, there was no community, Marin Community Clinic. There was one little county clinic on 4th Street and no Denical providers in the, state, in the county to take care of the children. So Connie Conjera was my student at UCSF. She was interested in community health. She wound up in a small clinic next to the Oregon border, small form worker clinic, federally qualified health center. We kept in contact. As soon as the Marine Community Clinic had a, opened their dental clinic, I said, Connie, you have to come to Marin County. So she came and interviewed and you selected her. And we just talked, she's been here for 10 years. So thank you, wonderful person. <laughs> So our dental professionals in dental school, there is a core of them that are very interested in giving back to the community in public health. So you have to recognize that. So Marin County doesn't need a lot of help uh, from uh, our uh, tobacco tax initiative. As part of the Prop 56 tobacco tax, uh, the state dental director, Dr. Jay Kumar, who came from New York, recognized the state was very weak on doing training or technical assistance. So we at UCSF School of Dentistry received the contract from the state to provide training and technical assistance to all 61 health districts. So we're looking from the Oregon border to the Mexico border to Nevada. We're looking at Trinity County, Siskiyou County, Alpine County, uh, Mono, Inyo, and Imperial. Uh, Marin County doesn't need our help. Uh, the Bay Area uh, health districts uh, don't need our help. There's a lot of qualified consultants, and you have them here. Uh, trained professionals, access to UCSF, Pacific Dental School, public health people that are able to provide you within your health department and without your health department with assistance. Most of these other counties uh, have no background. Uh, you had funding from first five for years to at least have a core uh, the people we're dealing with uh, might be uh, health administrators, people with MPHs, no dental background. So that's our goal, is to assist all 61 uh, counties. Uh, we have uh, a technical assistance staff we have, that are here, uh, Keiko Mirahama, uh, Katie Conklin uh, are here. We staff and train uh, questions from the uh, local health departments throughout the state. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Halle Parlock, a uh, specialist in uh, dental public health and uh, American Dental Association consultant on water fluoridation. We have Marjorie Stocks, who's a Marin County resident in Larkspur, who's now with UCSF uh, as a fluoridation consultant. Their goal is to watch the border the border between Sonoma and Marin County. We know there's a caravan 
of anti-fluoridationists approaching the border. <laughs> and Marjorie from her lanai in Larkspur is watching the border. So be, be confident that uh, you are well protected. Both Marjorie and Howard have testified at your water board meetings with the IJ, with the local dental society. They have beaten back attack after attack after attack uh, over the years. So they'll be here. You can ask them questions. And we're fortunate to have them in Marin County. As you know, North Marin County Water District is not fluoridated. There's a lot of issues with distribution. You can talk to Marjorie and Howard about those issues. Uh, it's quite complicated. So UCSF, you can see on the right, we have a, we established a group called uh, California Oral Health Technical Assistance Center. So this is where uh, we get questions. We have a uh, listserv. We have training material, a website where we are interacting with all 61 local uh, health departments. It's kind of overwhelming. Uh, we don't get many questions from you, which is fine, but we're always here to help. We don't get many questions from San Francisco, Alameda, Contra Costa, San Mateo. Same thing in uh, Southern California. Uh, the well-sourced uh, and professional people that are available in urban centers are able to handle this. The, we're really concentrating on uh, rural activities. So with that, I'll just leave it there that uh, UCSF is here to assist you. Uh, I'll still be on the uh, Oral Health Advisory Committee, and it's good for me. Why is it good for me? Well, I interact with Dr. Kumar at the state. I go to state meetings. They start discussing stuff. Uh, Marin County has a 34-page scope of work from the state, which is kind of overwhelming. That's typical state stuff. So I go to the Oral Health Advisory Committee, and I get to hear the nurses, the teachers, people from WIC, and it just doesn't match what Dr. Kumar wants and what's happening locally are two different things. So it's good for me. I can take it back, and I'll continue doing that. That's why I appreciate uh, joining your local advisory committee. It helps me uh, to relate back to the state, and I'm not bashful, so I do take it back, but there's a lot of issues uh, and bureaucracy at the state with pushback. So continue their good work and uh, work on the health disparities. That's the tr strategic plan for the County of Marin. Uh, I do get to IJ, so I do read, find out what's going on. That uh, the main focus with the Health and Human Service Department is to tackle the disparities in health issues and other issues, and oral health has the same disparities. And you know what areas of the county have those disparities. So the oral health plan, I'm sure, will focus on those. So thank you. And we'll be here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silverstein. Um, I'm Julie Michaels, the Oral Health Program Coordinator, and it's great to see all of you here today. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to go over our strategic plan, um, which is... Hey. So um, this, is, this whole planning process over the last year has been overseen and guided by our Oral Health Steering Committee, and of which Dr. Silverstein is one, and he mentioned. And I want to kind of give you an overview of what happened. So in March of last year, with the help of our consultants, Hatchell, Tabernick, and Associates, uh, we developed a needs assessment, which many of you participated in. We completed it in July. And in August of last year, we had a big community stakeholder group. And what happened there was uh, we went through all the data that we found in Marin, and the stakeholders, the community said, we now see the data, and here's the priorities. Here's what we think really needs to happen, given the data that we have. And so using that, 
we formed planning work groups. There were three planning work groups. Some of them were from the community, some from the, the retreat, some from our, um, our steering committee. And these planning groups spent all of last fall really digging into the needs and the priorities and they set goals and strategies and objectives and some of the action steps. So they did the skeleton of our strategic plan, which is now available. And then beginning in January, we started plan our implementation work groups. So some of the same folks, some new folks came in and they're actually making this happen. Now we have the strategic plan and the implementation work groups are putting action steps and timelines and actually beginning to do the work to make our, our uh, strategic, strategic plan a living document. So it's a very exciting time for us. I just want to um, acknowledge the steering committee. If you're on the steering committee, could you just stand up? I think many people are here, maybe most. Um, so thank you. These folks have dedicated time and work over the last year, um, and they're, it's really been impressive, and they're quite an amazing group. Um, so they have guided our process. And then the work groups that I mentioned, there are three, access work group, communication and data work group, and then our education and integration work group. And if you were on a work group, could you please stand up and so we can see who was on. I know many of the steering committee, yay, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So if you have questions today, they, these people are maybe at your table or around, ask them about the process, about the needs assessment, the strategic plan. They're a great resource. And if you want to join us, they can also give you information about that. <clears throat> so just to dig a little now into our plan, we have an awesome vision, healthy smiles for all in Marin. So that's what we're all working toward. And we have five goals. And the first goal is to implement communication strategies to educate the public, uh, practitioners, and decision makers about health. So this goal is really centered around communication. Our second goal, goal is to build infrastructure to support data collection, evaluation, implementation, and sustainability. So this goal really is focused on data and evaluation. Our third goal is coming, I'm sure. Maybe. There it is, okay. So our third goal is to promote oral health by educating and aligning private providers, health systems, and community programs. So we're really focusing on educating with that one. The fourth goal is to increase access to oral health through providing infrastructure and coordination with public health programs, healthcare systems, dental professionals, and other institutions. And then our fifth one is to reduce disparities in access to oral health for our Marin County populations. Okay, so those are, those are pretty uh, interesting, challenging goals. How are we gonna get there? Let's talk about how we're gonna achieve our goals, these ambitious goals. So the first one, which was uh, centered around communication strategies, some of the objectives are, one is to leverage the California Smile Campaign materials uh, and really use those to reach our vulnerable populations. And there's a whole table out there, I hope you stop by, but they have some really great materials, California Smile Campaign, so please pick some up on your way out. This is a California-wide campaign, so we're really hoping to leverage all of these great resources to reach vulnerable populations here. We want to implement an oral health communication plan, which we're in the process of doing, and we want to integrate oral health into ongoing health and human services and other systems of care. And so our second goal is to build infrastructure to support data collection and evaluation. And some of our objectives include increasing the available data on priority populations, uh, evaluating and monitoring the progress of the program so that we know we're successful, developing a sustainability plan that includes identifying additional funding sources, and ensuring that at least two underserved elementary schools will collect and report kindergarten oral health data. So these are our early objectives that we're hoping to reach. And if you want to follow along, there's some of these at your table, too, with even more detail. Uh, let's see. 
So the third goal is promoting oral health through education. Here we want to create an oral health prevention plan, uh, increase the number of pediatric primary care settings where oral health is integrated, train providers on reimbursable pediatric oral health. So this is things like fluoride varnish, screenings, billing and referral for the zero to five population. And we want to train providers in treatment of very young children and also train prenatal and pediatric healthcare providers. So the fourth goal, which focuses on access, we want to increase access to oral health through improving infrastructure and coordination. Some of our objectives here are to increase the pool of providers, including specialists that serve underserved populations. So this is a particularly uh, critical need in Marin. We know that over 850 children over the last 10 years have gone to Sonoma County to get their treatment under general anesthesia. So this is a, something that we need to really work on here to have more specialists available in county for those children. Um, and we also want to expand existing oral health networks. And our fifth goal, reducing disparities in access to oral health. So some of these goal objectives include, we want to increase the number of pregnant women in the 100 to 200% federal poverty level. Our needs assessment told us that, that is the, those women are really being missed. And so that's something that we need to work on in terms of access. We want to increase oral health education and prevention in early childhood programs. And we want to reduce the disparities by piloting school-based and school-linked linked approaches in our high-risk schools, and also increase access to care by piloting services and teledentistry in our senior centers. So there's a lot of information available. The needs assessment, which Bahar is going to go over soon, and our strategic plan, and upcoming things that are happening as far as events like this, all of this can be found at our website. MarinOralHealth.org. You can download all those documents today and please continue to visit us as more becomes available. And it's uh, easy to access here. And also, if you want to learn more about joining a work group or joining the steering committee or attending future events, this is where you'll find that information as well as on the back tables. And I will also be going over it uh, a little bit more later in this in this presentation. So thank you very much. I think we get to hear from Bahar. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Are you in the need of stretching out, getting some snacks? Please go ahead, because I'm going to talk about some data. And I know that's the most boring part, <laughs> trying to incentivize you with something else. Um, I'm Bahar Amanzadeh. I'm a public health dentist. And um, I have been in the role of really dental health administrator for, for Alameda County Department of Public Health. Um, and then before that, I was at UCSF as a faculty. And now I am I'm just helping different counties and different organizations in, um, in doing this kind of work, just basically looking at infrastructure, doing needs assessment and planning and things like that. So um, we embarked on this, as, as, as Julie said, on this process of needs assessment and planning process uh, with our amazing steering committee and, and the Department of um, Public Health in Marine, um, and me and my colleagues as HDA, um, uh, we were helping this process basically to do the needs assessment and do the, uh, facilitate the planning process. Uh, my colleague um, Susan already talked about the importance of oral health, and I think by now you're you're all bought in, right? Um, we know that oral health impacts the overall health, and in order to have a basically a quality of life, or in order to thrive in life, um, oral health is an important ingredient of that. And it's also costly, right? As you heard. So if you have um, health administrators here, people from um, um, managed care organizations, you know that this actually impacts all of us and all of us are organizations. Um, 
here is what we did in the assessment. We basically, as I said, worked with the steering committee and uh, we looked into some data. We did some secondary data analysis on the data sources that were available um, and we collected some primary data. We uh, uh, conducted a survey called Adult Oral Health Risk Survey. Um, we had a, a relatively good turnout, about 325 um, participants. Uh, we, have, we did key informant interviews and we did focus groups in the county. And here is some results. So here's just to give you kind of overview of the county uh, um, residents. Uh, as you see, we, we are in a county that is mostly occupied by adults, uh, 20, uh, 45 to 64 years old, um, as well as 65 and plus years old are kind of half of the population. So as we look into the results of the need assessment planning, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, poverty, Morin is not known to have a high rate of poverty. However, um, as all of you that work in the arenas of public health, you know that the disparities is actually in um, in all of the in many of the neighborhoods in the county. Um, some specific areas, uh, let me see, have some higher rates of poverty around here, and here's like a. Um, a little moderate kind of poverty and um, very low poverty around there. So now that we have county, the map of the county in our heads and where is what, now let's delve into some oral health status and utilization of services in the county. Again, disclaimer, these are the data, this is a summary of the data that we're introducing today because of the time, and also we had some limitations in the data that we could get. Um, just looking at the kindergarten assessment data, uh, and this is a kind of like a, a state mandate which is actually not being done in every school, but still it gives us some, um, some overview that 65% of kindergartners have participated. It's not 100%, but it's not that low either. Um, and 7% were diagnosed with untreated tooth decay in, the, in, in uh, last year. Um, and again, as we look at the data in Maureen County, the disparities is what actually comes out. So even, even though the 7% is, lot of, is not a big number, but when you look at the disparity between the schools, that actually jumps off. That some of the schools had like 22% and some had zero out of those that actually were screened. There are some other data from Head Start data that showed some reduction of uh, need for treatment in the preschool age kids, right? Again, none of these two sources of data are um, kind of epidemiologically population-based, but it's kind of a snapshot as what we see, right? So these are all good news. These are, um, this is a pie chart of the emergency department dental visits, right? So these are, preventable uh, dental visits. So basically the ones that are not like an injury, it's not a car accident or something like that, right? The things that could be prevented. And when we look at that, um, and this is 2018, and when you look at the distribution um, of the numbers, I think it's actually the numbers around, um, if I'm not mistaken, I forgot to put that, around 400, uh, no, around 1,500 actually in that year. And when you, um, Actually, no, 500 was better. Here it has the numbers, actually. So around 500, and out of those, you will see that uh, 18 to 44 years old have the highest kind of piece of the pie, and then after that, 45 to 64 years old. And, you know, like zero to five years old here is a smaller uh, portion of the pie. However, 9% of this is zero to five years old, right? So if you look at that, it's still like that that's a big percentage for zero to five years old to end up in the emergency room uh, for preventable dental conditions, right? So basically we want, we want this to be zero. That's where we wanna be, right? Here is some snapshots of the results from Adult Oral Health Survey. Again, this is, uh, Marine community residents, a good distribution. Our uh, uh, community stakeholders were amazing helping us to make sure we have a good kind of like a planning around the county to distribute the survey. Um, so 65% reported that they have dental, they have 
uh, visited dentists in the last year, and this is one of the metrics that is used nationally, like have you visited the dentist, right? Um, and 44% of adult population reported that um, the reason that they didn't visit the dentist was because of lack of the money or high cost. So again, this is more in county guys, right? But the disparity is really palpable here. Um, and if you look at this, it is kind of like a distribution of, of those that they said that they haven't uh, visited. Latinos have the, had the highest rate and adults age 34 to 44 as well as over 65 years old were the one that had a hard time visiting the dentist, right? This is a percentage of tooth extraction. Like it is another kind of those kind of survey questions that have you lost one or more teeth or have you lost all of your teeth, right? Um, and um, this is um, the, I don't know if you see here, but the orange is California um, average and the blue is marine average. Uh, and for 35 to 44 years old, reporting one or more tooth extraction, Moraine is higher than the state average. And again, our numbers um, is not that high, so I don't want to make this only 75. Um, but still, it's like a snapshot like um, when it comes to adult oral health. And we will have some more data around that. So it's a little alarming when it comes to adult oral health. Uh, and the same around uh, 65 years, 64 and older that have lost all of their teeth, right? Um, Oh, actually, no, this is, this is reporting that tooth extraction is not all of the teeth. Um, now I wanted to talk about pregnant women. So pregnant women visiting the dentist is one of the most upstream approaches we could have when it comes to oral health, right? That's where it all starts. And in Morgan County, we are doing pretty well. And this is general population. This is not medical um, population. We'll talk about that portion a little more. So in Moraine County, it's 72.3%. Um, more than the state average is 43%. So fantastic. Give yourself a round of applause. Great job. Um, and how are there disparities, right? So when you look at that, and again, that's the theme that keeps coming back in Moraine County. The, um, a working poor kind of section of the population between 100 and 200 FBL um, seems to have a hard time accessing dental care. And it might be parallel to some other um, health reports that you guys um, have looked at. Again, this is just like highlighting that piece that um, the 100 to 200 FBL um, is kind of like a little different. It's still, it's still higher than the state average, but something we can work on. So um, another preventive measure that we have is dental sealants. And that's when, when a child gets their permanent teeth, right? And my dentist colleagues around the room can tell you that that's one of the easiest procedures that you can do after fluoride varnish. Um, that will uh, kind of prevent the cavities on permanent teeth, right? Um, so that's like if you want to invest on one public health measure for, for, for permanent teeth, that would be sealants. Um, and in, in Moraine County, it's, um, it, it's weird that we are below state average. Because when you look at the preventive services, Moraine is actually doing good. And you have some amazing infographics that our colleagues at Children Now has, has this in our tables. And you look at that for preventive services, we are good and we are increasing. But when it comes to sealants, we are, it is increasing. So some of these state initiatives, some of this work is paying off. However, we are still way below state average. So something there to look at when it comes to rate of the sealants. And this is both for six to nine years old and 10 to 14 years old. And these are the ages that you actually apply the sealants. Um, when it comes to adults and utilization of care, um, um, and this is, right now we are focusing on medical. Right? So kind of like, when you looked at the pregnant women one, that was the general population, right? But now when it comes to other, this is the medical data we are looking at. So when you look at the underserved medical population, adults' dental visits are not that high. So there's a lot of work that can be done around that. So it's improving, it's going up, um, but it's still not there. So we are even, um, so you see kind of like this is, the blue is California, the uh, orange is blue, uh, is marine. We're a little higher than the state, um, 
but you know, a state average is not that great. So I, I don't think that's what's, that's not the standard we want to keep to. The same with 65 plus, actually um, they are, again, that's load and toll visits. We are improving though. And now that we know the extent of the problem, we want to know what's the workforce. Do we have enough dentists? Do we have enough dental providers? Do we have enough infrastructure to take care of that? Um, and the answer is, what do you think? No, we don't. Um, here are uh, some community clinics in the county, kind of like, you know, centered around these different areas. If you remember that kind of poverty level here has more, and we have the Novato Center here, we have this Point Reyes, but we, we, there's not much around here, kind of like geographically, basically. Um, and some of our, for some of the health clinics um, don't have dental, like the small ones, like Bolina, um, Bolinas and Stinson Beach Health Medical Centers. There are small centers that they don't have dental. There's opportunities there. And when you look at the private providers, uh, there are not many. And this is dental hygienists as well as the dentist, private fee-for-service dentist. There's like, you can count them. Like, like when we talk about that, I say, yeah, such and such and such, like three of them that people can refer to, right? So very few. So we definitely have workforce issues then, right? Um, and there are some good examples of contracting through Marine Community Clinic that can be replicated. So there's good news as well as room for improvement. Um, I want to kind of quickly go through the results of the focus groups and key informant interviews because they added a lot of depth. And I know my time, my time is limited and I want to kind of have some time for questions and answers. Um, so as we said, all of the focus groups were reported that there are significant barriers for accessing care, especially when it came to adult, you know, insurance coverage, long wait time. So we heard that from the focus group participants. People are feeling that, right? There are barriers. Um, and, um, you know, many of people actually had the kind of oral health knowledge, but they didn't know how to access the care. Key informant interviews also, uh, kind of the summary of that was that they, they have, key informants uh, have seen improvements in oral health services access in Moraine, especially in rural areas that have been more disparities. Um, however, there are still standing barriers when it comes to geographic um, kind of barriers, transportation, availability for adults and all of that. So this is the main theme that came, came coming up. It's just um, more senior access is also a big part of that, that um, kept coming up. And then you, knowing that, um, you know, this county has a big um, senior population, that's uh, something that we have looked into into planning process. Basically disparities based on geographic, income, age-based, rural versus urban has been one of the main keys of this needs assessments. Um, need for education and community outreach, need to engage communities as like one of them, another big piece that has come up, right? Um, and through this process, one thing that we try to do is to look at what are the opportunities based on what we have, right? The strengths that are in the system and now the needs assessment, what we can do. And these are some opportunities that we looked at while we were developing the plan. And, um, and Julie did a great job on kind of like giving you an overview of the plan, but this way you can kind of connect these together, basically looking into a school-based oral health and how that can be improved, expand the successful prenatal oral health programs, develop communication plan. And, um, look into the integration efforts, integration into primary care efforts and how can we kind of bring different stakeholders together around all of these. Um, a specialist care building programs that uh, tackle disparities, as Dr. Silverstein mentioned, that's the biggest thing and in Morin County we see that is very, um, is very real. Um, and really continue to strengthen the oral health committee and kind of like a groups like this because this is something that cannot be done alone. And we as a group can do that together. There's no magic bullet, this is just a process. And, um, and you know, just seeing Maureen County and having worked with them in the last six or seven months, um, I have real hopes and I think we're gonna get there. So thank you so much. So we are opening up now for some questions. I think we have to go with one of them. Right. 
Um, okay, you heard amazing presentations, and now we are open to questions. And I will bring my colleagues up to answer the questions if I don't know the answer. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. So, yes, um, this is a big problem, and um, I will answer my part of it. So, there has been some changes in medical reimbursement, right? So, adults, so we are all talking because there's some momentum around changing what we exactly talked about, right? Um, so medical rates for adults have changed, medical rates for children have changed, right? And these are all in the last couple of years, right? And one of the strategies that this group is working on, the access for group, and we would love to have you on the access for group if you're available, but um, is to actually do some work with the dental providers and bring these new changes in the reimbursement fees and all of that and try to get more buyers into that, right? Um, but we know that, um, you know, that, that takes some time. In the meanwhile, kind of like working with our community clinics to see how we can um, kind of expand some of this. Contracting with private providers is one way to, through community clinics, to kind of find a medium. So there are some strategies in the plan um, However, when it comes to really kind of reaching out to the population, pharmacies, I think it's a great place. And I don't think we have think, thought about that. I think that's something we should really should put into our plan as far as somewhere to distribute the materials, distribute the resources, and be the pharmacist, be the place with that. Dr. Kadera, do you want to add? Thanks. Um, at Marine Community Clinics, I'm Connie Kadera, and I've been seeing a shift in the way we treat patients, especially adults. Um, there was a time in which medical didn't accept anybody, so we would get a lot of emergencies. Nowadays, we do take emergencies every day at Marine Community Clinics, so I think it would be a great opportunity for us connect and uh, create a list of when we're open, because we're open seven days a week. We have evening hours, so definitely the access is there. Holidays, I'm afraid we won't be able to do that, but at least we have more hours now. And if, pa if a patient is in pain, we'll do our best to fit in, in between patients. So uh, I never thought about the pharmacy and having a list. I think this is wonderful, so thank you for bringing that up. We're gonna work on that. And we do take patients that don't have any insurance. So you don't have to have an insurance, and we will see you uh, regardless of your inability to pay. Now, we do have some requirements, but in emergency cases, we don't ask for those because when somebody's in pain and suffering, we focus on that. 
So I hope that helps a little bit, but having the information will be really great, yeah. Thank you. I also just wanted to add, as Julie was mentioning earlier, there's a communications work group, and we'll, we're going to be preparing flyers and postcards and posters and all that, and I'll be sure to add um, pharmacies to that for our distribution. Amazing, thank you so much. Other questions? Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's of great. course you do, Fred. Yes. <laughs> Here you go. The Prop, oh, I'm sorry. The Prop 56 money that came down was $2 a pack for tobaccos. So one of the things, as a public health pharmacist, I see the dentists are the first line of defense for looking for leukoplakias in the mouth and uh, smokers. Are you taking any of the money? Are you doing anything about... Um, educating your patients about smoking. Is there any of this money going into uh, maybe getting together a team of, of, of dentists that, that do more than just uh, pull teeth? And, uh, and again, uh, as a pharmacist, I don't know what you dentists do, but... Right. Uh, I'm a public health <laughs> dentist. <laughs> but, but I'd like to see you uh, use some of the money for discovering leukoplakias, cancers in the mouth, and that kind of thing, and educate. I'm not sure. Maybe UCSF does this kind of thing already, and I'm just ignorant. Right. Thank you. It's a tobacco tax money, so we better, right? Um, yes, there are some initiatives in our education work group to develop materials around um, tobacco prevention um, and kind of have some focus on that. Um, I know there are some counties that they, they have to do like very specific training of the dental providers and do more of integration of that. Um, it wasn't identified as one of our big focuses, but it's still it's a focus when it comes to developing the educational materials for the community. Yes, at UCSF, part of the Prop 56 money in our uh, California Oral Health Technical Assistance Center, Dr. Ben Chafee is nationally known for his tobacco intervention for dental practices. He has developed a YouTube video on how to counsel in dental offices, how to do the uh, counseling for tobacco use. And most dentists in uh, dental practice, in fact, all, are trained for the first patient to come in. They do a complete oral health assessment. They look at all the soft tissue. They look at the tongue. And they ask for tobacco use. So uh, dentists are trained. They do that. And they do identify leukoplakas and oral health uh, lesions. And we do have... Uh, material developed, uh, and, and as Bahar said, some counties put tobacco cessation as a top priority for Prop 56 monies. It's up to the county. I think we had eight counties in the state that put it at a top priority. It's still in the work plan, but if it is a top priority. So all dentists are trained to do that. Any other questions? Okay. One thing, while I have the microphone, uh, one other thing that I forgot when I was talking about the process is really acknowledging the um, health services agency. I know we say Department of Public Health, but it's actually health services agency, right? Health and Human Services Agency's contribution, and especially Kathleen, I wanted to shout out to you to really, as a leader, being part of this process and taking it on. And I think as a county, we need that. We need that leadership. Um, our first five is around the center, is around the corner. Are all of our MCH leaders, and, and with your leadership and with Julie on board, um, thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna have a little quick fire challenge and hear from some of the oral health programs um, around the county and uh, hear about some of the programs, so excuse me, some of the challenges that they're facing and the way they deal with those. So first up is Jennifer Zanika. Hi, I'm Jennifer Zuniga. I'm with the County of Marin. I work for the Maternal Child and Adolescent Program and. Uh, in public health, and I do the children's oral health program. This is for me. All right. And that's my little guy there at the Children's Museum up in Sonoma County. Just, they have a little dental office set up there. It's pretty fun. All right, so I'm just doing some updates on our program. Um, pretty much it's just me. I'm a dental hygienist and hygienist in alternative practice as well. 
And I work part time and then that lovely gentleman is my volunteer, Steve. He comes in a couple hours a week for me to help me with administrative work. And um, just a little bit of program history. You heard a little bit about it um, earlier. First Five funded originally and then got some funding from some other foundations. And now I'm currently with um, MCAH um, from an expansion through the county. Um, all right. So when this program first started, uh, a little bit before I started working here um, with Margaret Fisher, she was finding 55% of the children screened had visible decay. And back in those years, um, the county clinics, or uh, the community clinics hadn't opened so much. We just had the county dental clinic. And through the years with the access of care um, increasing, you can see that the um, rate of decay that we found through our program steadily increased and now for the last several years we're pretty much only finding about five percent of the children actually have visible decay um, so yeah so the access from all the the clinics that i've opened up have really really made an impact um, on what i've been seeing in my screenings uh, so what do i do in my program i do a lot of education um, and preventive work I do circle time presentations at preschool, so I come in, educate the children about good oral health practices. I offer free dental screenings as well um, and fluoride varnish applications. And I work mostly in preschools, but also in some elementary schools. Um, I do play groups. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I fill out the kindergarten oral health assessment for any of the children that I see that will be starting kindergarten in the fall and give those to their families if they still need them to put in their kindergarten registration packets. And we do case management and follow up with any of the families that are found, uh, of children that are found to have any visible decay. I do a lot of parent trainings and provider trainings. Uh, I recently went to Dominican University and worked with some nursing students there to train them on oral health. Um, I recently trained a group of family daycare providers um, on how to give their own oral health presentation in their facilities and they did a make and take so they, we made an entire oral health kit and that was through um, MC3. And I go out with the flagship which is a uh, local free preschool um, through the library, and it's a big bus that goes out. And I do um, education screenings there. I've been to the libraries at Story, story Times. I do um, early intervention programs and do screenings up through their second graders and then various community events and fairs. So if anybody wants me to come out and do some education or screening event, um, that's what I'm here for. Um, <laughs> So yeah, children's education, a couple different things that I do is the circle times, story times. During the summer, I have a special dental magic show that I do for children um, in summer programs that might be starting kindergarten in the fall, and that's always really fun. I'm always looking for volunteers, so if you want to be a dental magician, come on out with me. I'll train you. It's not that hard. Um, and I've done community helper presentations, just kind of teaching kids about like what do we do in the dental field. So if you want to grow up to work in dental, um, and career day presentations with younger kids all the way up through teenagers. And then parent education, I also invite the parents to come to the magic shows and we, it's kind of interactive for both, so I'm teaching the kids and the parents at the same time. And then I do just plain parent education classes with just parents. And um, here's some of the providers that I've worked with um, with education presentations, teaching them how to bring education to their groups and then also on how to um, apply fluoride varnish through that. Um, let's see here. Okay, so this is our last year's um, things that we did. I had 52 events. Most of those were screening and education. A couple were just education only. Not um, all of my events asked me to do a screening. They might just want me to come in and, and train or, or talk to kids. Uh, I screened 542 kids, placed fluoride on 375 of those. Um, our education is the biggest piece there. I had um, over 1,000 children educated and 300 of their parents. And then provider education classes, uh, just over 100. And what we found last year was 70% of our children didn't have any um, visible signs of decay. And that would be what we consider a class one. Uh, about 25, 26% had beginning decay, so those white spot, brown spot lesions. Um, 
And then about 4% last year had visible decay. Um, and these are just all the groups that I work with that's out on the flagship bus. Um, yeah, I only have about seven minutes here. And our program success is we wanna make sure that children are all linked to a dental home. So we make sure that they have a provider or give them the referrals um, and re resource lists to um, have a dental home and that the children do receive any necessary dental services uh, with case management and follow-up after our services. And overall, of course, we want to improve the community um, oral health. So, uh, And if you know of anybody or your group would like to have an education event or a screening or you have a, a community event coming up, you'd like me to be there, um, it's pretty easy. Just contact me. We pick our dates. We figure out what kind of event it is. If parents aren't gonna be there, then I send out a consent form packet, so they have those all filled out for when I come, and then we come to the event, and within two to three weeks, we send all the results to the school. And this is my contact information, if you would like to get a hold of me or schedule any event. And that's my little boo, the very first dental screening that he uh, came with me out on the flagship. <laughs> now he's five, so that's all I have, so yeah. Hi, I'm, good morning, I'm Reba Meggs, and I'm the program manager of the Nutrition Wellness Program at the um, Health and Human Services under Public Health. Um, and I'm going to talk to you this morning about oral health and how nutrition impacts oral health. And I know Suzanne and a few of our presenters earlier this morning kind of alluded to how health is an important um, factor on oral, or nutrition is an important factor on oral health. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about nutrition and how that impacts our health. Um, and kind of a little slant on um, youth particularly and what we're seeing around oral health with, um, with our youth population and some of the things that we're doing about that. Let's see, get the clicker here. Actually, before I get started, because I am a nutrition wellness person, I'm gonna ask you all to stand up. <laughs> we haven't had a break, so I'm just gonna ask you to stand up and lift your arms up and stretch a little bit and kind of get the wiggles out. And go down and touch your toes. <laughs> Oh, and stand up, kind of march in place a little bit. <laughs> I noticed a break wasn't kind of inserted in the day, so I'm just going to do this right now. <laughs> All right. Okay, you guys can sit down. <laughs> but let me just insert that in now before we get started. A little wellness in the day. Okay. So when we talk about oral health and just wellness overall, um, one of the things that we know and kind of the most powerful tools that we have to present, prevent disease um, is nutrition and kind of our diet. And when that looks at, when we look at oral health, things like this are related to our diet as we know. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some guidelines and kind of how that's changed over the years, particularly as it relates to added sugar and kind of our nutrition. Um, and what we're really looking at is limiting sugar. Um, and those are some of the new U USDA guidelines that have come out over um, the last couple of years, particularly as it relates to labels. And that's when I talk a little bit later about what we do with youth. Um, activities like nutrition education and reading labels and things like that are kind of a big in one of those um, strategies. Uh, so when we look at kind of what we're looking at as it relates to nutrition and our guidelines, there's kind of five focus areas. One is to limit sugar, of course, support eat the, um, healthy eating habits, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the guidelines. Um, shift to healthier food and beverage choices, and when we all look at what we can do in our organizations of how we offer healthy food and beverages. Um, offer a variety of nutrient dense food and when we look at some of the disparities that we see we notice that we have a lot of low nutrient dense food um, which contribute to oral um, impact our oral health and just look at our overall eating patterns we want to promote healthy eating coverage and healthy lifestyles overall and what are healthy eating patterns so we've got this my plate and how many have seen that I know we try to get that out in the community a lot but really what we're looking at is just shifting the norm 
from eating more fruits and vegetables and less processed foods. And really what we're trying to do is limit our sugar overall. What's sugar? <laughs> this is all the things that constitutes what sugar is on the back of a label, and probably there's even more. <laughs> so it's kind of complicated when you think about added sugar, particularly or when it relates to oral health, because we know that added sugar is in everything. About 10 years ago, when we looked at where we got our added sugar from, the majority was from what we were drinking. Um, but we, this is kind of the breakdown when you look at a typical diet and where someone would get added sugar from. And surprisingly, we get a lot from our food and what we drink. Now it shifts, though. Recently, from the Center for Public Health Advocacy, we're showing that we're getting a lot of sugar from our foods. Here in Marin, when we look at what's kind of impacting our youth, particularly around sugar consumption, we know that it is sugar-sweetened beverages. We know particularly among youth, when you look at these bars here, the orange and the blue actually both represent sugar-sweetened beverages. So the blue is soda. So we know that youth are consuming probably one soda a day. And when we look at it among our communities of color, about 35% of our youth. And then the orange bar is sugar-sweetened beverage. And that can be an energy, <clears throat> excuse me, an energy drink. <clears throat> it can be orange juice. It can be any sugar-sweetened beverage. It can even be coffee. Um, so when you add those two, we know that youth are getting about two sugar, what we would call sugar-sweetened beverages a day in these groups. And the disparities between Marin um, in the state, you know, we're pretty much doing lower than the state average, but when you look at our communities of color in Marin, we're not. And so when you look at equity and kind of where we want to focus, particularly oral health and promotion, um, you know, we have some work to do there in our communities of color. So what do we want to limit our sugar take? And I'm just going to focus on sugar because we know, particularly when we're talking about youth, that is our kind of area of focus. Um, this is kind of what we're, the recommendations are right now. So preschoolers, we're saying that they should get no more than four teaspoons a day. Children, four to six, about three. Preteens, about, what is that, five. Women, about six. And men, about nine. And so that's what the recommendations are from the American Heart for sugar consumption a day. And we know the consequences. I mean, we talked about some of the consequences earlier on oral health, but we also know the health consequences as well. When we look at some of the impacts overall, we know that over the past 30 years that some of the impacts of overconsumption of sugar just in general has related to obesity, particularly diabetes. We know what, when we talk about impacts on health and costs and hospitalization, we know that that relates to about $35 billion. And then kind of to what Michelle was talking about earlier in the story that you really don't think about when you think about oral health in children, but particularly their <clears throat> the impacts of even death. We know that children who frequently consume beverages high in sugar are increased risk for dental caries. This can lead to pain, infection, loss of tooth, and because of infection, even severe death. So we also know that not every community has the opportunity to be the same. Um, so we're seeing a lot of legislation right now kind of being introduced around restricting beverages and particularly just sugar overall. We see that there's going to be some legislation coming out this year, particularly around the ban of big gulps. Um, we're looking at requiring health warnings, banning soda industries from offering subsidies, and potentially in 2020, the American, our, the California Medical Association and the California Dental Association are potentially putting a ballot on the measure to tax sugar-sweetened beverages, just as Berkeley and San Francisco and some of our other Bay Area cities have done. 
And so when we talk about teeth and oral health, I'm just going to put a few caution foods and drinks out there that you might already know, but just since our dentists are in our oral health, folks are here. <laughs> um, because we do do a lot of promotion around healthy drinks and that sort of thing and spa water. And I know sometimes acidic things um, can be more sensitive to your teeth. So I just wanted to put some of those. Of course, we know hard candy, chips, dried fruit but also those citrus things that we do sometimes promote in our spa water. We want to be a little bit more cautious when we're talking about oral health. And then just overall what we do in our program in promoting kind of healthy eating, particularly we want to promote water consumption, go for H2O. Um, Oscar, if you want to stand up, is our health educator. Just want to point out Oscar. He does a lot of health education in the community. We've got Oscar. Um, he does Potter the Otter, um, and Evelyn stand up as well. I know Evelyn as well works with um, Jennifer in the summertime doing Summer Bridge and nutrition education in the community. So I just want to recognize both of them from our program. And we have a table outside with some resources as well, and I'll have a slide that kind of highlights some of those. Um, we also want to limit kind of sugar with added, or, um, foods with added sugar. Um, and we do a lot of work in the community with youth around our communities of excellence. And I want to acknowledge Elaine Nagusi, if you want to stand up. She does a lot of work in the canal in Marin City with youth. Um, particularly this summer, we worked with some youth that did assessments out in the community and made some recommendations on healthy promotions at stores and put some signage up. That was really great right under um, Elaine's leadership. Some great work there with youth. Um, yeah, we also want to just kind of overall encourage fruit and vegetable consumption and particularly looking at, um, as it relates to our teeth, things with iron, calcium, vitamin D, and even taking nuts on the go and kind of promoting things like healthy snacks. And just wanted to also remind us that we all play a role in this. Um, when we look at kind of the work that we do, we look at it through the lens of what we call policy systems and environments. Um, and so when we look at our families and our schools, when you're offering health, um, you know, meals or having gatherings with your families to make sure that you're also offering healthy beverages and healthy food. Um, when, you're in, when we do work in our schools, we do nutrition education, but we also work with um, the school, for, school food service directors to look at what they're offering. We've also worked with Tara Linda High School students who've come to us and wanted to put a hydration station into their school because they're looking at it from an environmental lens. We're looking at it from a health lens of more water. <laughs> um, and so we've done that. We've looked at um, working with our retail outlets, as I mentioned, the work that Elaine's done with youth. I know I'm forgetting some of the great work that they've done. And then some of the sugar displays I know that we've done with Dr. Kaday and Marin Community Clinics and just putting out um, just new education around the community about how much sugar is really in the drinks that people are consuming um, and just kind of bringing awareness to that, particularly around reading labels. Um, I think that's um, where we really look at nutrition education and what we can do in forming is being better consumers. These are some of the resources that we have. And as I mentioned, we do have a um, table in the back if you're interested. So thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation to speak here today and um, talk to you about some of the issues we're currently experiencing in tobacco control. My name is Gabriela Passat. I work in the tobacco control program, community health and prevention at the County of Marin. And I will just jump right in and say that no tobacco product is safe for use in youth, or adults for that matter. And all tobacco products come with oral health consequences. And recently, we've been seeing a shift in the tobacco use patterns that is very concerning to us in public health and as members of our communities because it involves youth. So while use by our kids of traditional tobacco and combustible tobacco like cigarettes and cigars and also traditional smokeless tobacco like chews has been going down for a number of years. We are very concerned with, next slide please. 
with the fact that overall tobacco use by youth is rising, and the main driver behind that is the youth use of e-cigarettes and vaping products. Last year, some data came out from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, and that showed that there was such a dramatic increase in kids using e-cigarettes from the year before, 2017 to 2018, that it prompted the Surgeon General to release an advisory and declare youth vaping an epidemic. And this is a big deal because um, these advisories get issued very rarely. This was only the fourth one to be issued out of that office in 10 years. And if you look at the data, it is very concerning. Um, compared to 2017, in 2018, 1.5 million youth became new, new users of e-cigarettes. And a total of 4.9 million youth used a tobacco product. So that is the population of Ireland. That's a lot of kids. And in Marine, next slide please. We are used to getting accolades for how well we are doing. Uh, we are a healthy county overall and we're performing well on a lot of uh, health indicators. But it's not the same story with youth vaping. We've been seeing dramatic increases in youth vaping and using e-cigarettes. And this is data from the California Healthy Kids um, Survey. This is a survey conducted every two years by the California Department of Education. And you can see from 2016, for ninth graders, there, there has been more than a do doubling of the rate of use of e-cigarettes from nine to 20%. And it's even worse, uh, worse for 11th graders where the numbers are 11% in 2016, and in 2018, um, almost a third of them used e-cigarettes. So why are we concerned with vaping? Um, for starters, vaping is not just inhaling a water vapor like a lot of the kids seem to think. The, these products are not regulated by the FDA, and there's a long story why that is. I'm not going to go into that today. So this means that the nicotine concentration doesn't have, there are no standards regulating that. And there are no standards for any of the chemicals in the vaping juices or vaping liquids. And there are over 7,000 chemicals in these liquids. And of concern to us are what are called flavoring chemicals or flavors. These are found in almost all e-cigarette and vaping products liquids. Tobacco companies have long used flavors to create these initiating products. They know that by masking the harsh taste, they will attract kids. Kids are attracted to flavors. So vaping companies are pretty much doing the same thing right now. And that's why you have um, cotton candy or gummy bears flavors in these liquids. And going back to the nicotine, the nicotine concentration varies widely, but in this pod, and maybe you cannot see it because it's very tiny, this is a pod that is used with the most popular youth vaping device that was created by um, our neighbor company down in San Francisco, Juul Laboratories. The nicotine concentration in this pod is the equivalent of the nicotine concentration in a full pack of cigarettes. And we hear that some kids use as much as two pods per day. So I know that the focus of our talk today is oral health, but you cannot ignore the effects that this huge amount of nicotine is going to have on a developing teenage brain. And it's just something that we have to be concerned with. Regarding oral health, there are no longitudinal studies as far as I know, but this huge amount of nicotine um, will have an effect through its vasoconstrictive effects and reducing blood flow to the oral cavity, and it will uh, make people who um, use e-cigarettes daily more prone for oral disease. Regarding the other chemicals, there is data showing that these flavoring chemicals and the base that makes the, the liquids viscous, which is glycerin or uh, propylene glycol, these um, substances cause DNA damage, and they also um, stimulate bacteria growth. And so these are, again, bad consequences for our kids' oral health. 
The other thing that we're concerned with, aside from the direct health effects, are the fact that these kids are more likely, kids who vape are more likely to be dual users of a vaping pro excuse me, product, as well as a traditional tobacco product, like cigarettes. And also, there is an increased risk for transitional to a traditional tobacco product, so smoking. And we all know, uh, some speakers before me have already noted what smoking does to the oral health, causes periodontal disease, um, increases the, the recovery time of, after periodontal surgery, increases risk for oral cancers. So this is a problem we have on our hands. Um, there is a new generation of kids addicted to nicotine, and we have to really tackle it right now before it's too late. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Connie Kadira. I'm the Chief Dental Officer at Marine Community Clinics and a general dentist. Um, I was asked to talk about adults and the, the barriers that we see at our clinics when we treat patients. So um, these will be focused mostly on adults, even though we also treat children. I decided to put that slide with the picture. This is our first dental clinic that we built back in 2008. So I'm very proud of that because still standing and really busy. Let's see here, next week. So before I get started, I wanna quote somebody, a, a patient that once said, how can I have good teeth when I have, how can I have good health when I have bad teeth? Think about that. Somebody who is suffering, somebody who really knows the connection was asking the dentist, how can I have good health? So I think this impacts everybody and we need to pay attention to that because everything is connected as everybody has said in the slides today. I see four obstacles. We see four obstacles at Marine Community Clinics with adult dental health. The first one, as everybody has pointed out, is lack of access. Back in 2008, the only clinic that was providing dental services was Marin County Clinic. And I think that clinic was not able to provide all the services, so it was more of an urgent care clinic. And when we opened in 2008, we didn't have adult dental coverage. Medical had canceled the services, so we were seeing mostly children and adults on an emergency basis, but it was mandated by the state. We knew that we needed to make a change anyway. So through the years, we were able to add more clinics, more hours, more dentists to increase this access. So I want to, um, I won't go into detail into the graph, but this is the increase of dental, adult dental patients that we've seen since 2008. So back in 2008, we only saw 161, and every year we increase the hours and the locations. We're increasing all the numbers until last year that we saw 7,073 patients. And you imagine, thank you. <laughs> you can imagine where are these patients coming from when this is a wealthy county. So we have a lot of pockets of poverty. And how do we do that? We increased it, now we have 36 dentists. And right now, today, as we speak, we have 15 dentists in all the three sites that we have seeing patients. From eight to five, we have days. Some other days, we have additional hours from five to nine. We open Saturdays and we open on Sundays. So we have really explored all the possibilities to increase access to care, but even with that, we still have to definitely pay attention to the urgent care. So we have one chair dedicated every day to see emergencies in each clinic. So we're seeing about 30 patients a day. So you can imagine the needs that we have here. And in addition, we also treat special populations. We, of pregnancy patients, we, we see those on Sundays. Reader House, these are unhoused patients, and we see them on 4th Street. We have Saturdays and Sundays where we're seeing them. Ryan Webb patients, those are the patients with HIV, and we also treat those. And Center Point is a rehab center, and we see those patients as well. So we're trying to encompass all the population here in Marin County, because as you know, there is not much going on with private dentists being able to accept medical. 
The second obstacle that we see at Marine Community Clinics is the complexity of care. First of all, there is no insurance that is really available for everybody, and not everybody likes coming to the dentist. We have to be honest about that. <laughs> so we see a lot of dental neglect. When the patients come to us, the problems are so significant that they require a lot of appointments to be able to bring them to a stable state in which they can eat, they can smile, and they can have a normal life. But when they come, they're in pain. So we have to treat that one step at a time. So our, our uh, visits many times don't come to an end when we have a treatment plan. Also, they have a lot of comorbidities. They have high blood pressure and controlled diabetes, including we have some behavioral health issues that really, really prevent us from doing dental work. So when the patient sits in our chair, it's not just the mouth. We have to treat the entire person and we have to pay attention to that. And of course, we have the social determinants. Many patients can really get to our clinics. They don't have a way to find transportation. They have all their appointments. They forget about our appointments. So we have to really be a little bit compassionate about the, the problems that they have every day. And of course, the low dental knowledge they only come when they have pain, when they see a need. So this is really complicated. So I wanted to bring it to your attention the number of visits that we have since we opened up 10 years ago. Um, the first year in 2008, we had 368 patients. And again, this is patients 21 and older. Medical defines an adult patient who is 21 or older. So anybody below 21, we can see as a child. And they have more coverage. So 368 and move forward, 10 years later, we had 21,762 visits for the 7,000 patients. So if you divide that, it's roughly three appointments per patient. So it's hard. It's hard to complete a treatment plan when you can see them so few times, like few times or they don't come back. And uh, we definitely want to focus on prevention. But this is complicated when the patients can, can come here all the time. So that's the comparison between the two. You can see the ratio more or less. And it, it kind of steady over the years. We increase the number of patients, and also we increase the number of visits. But it's always higher, and we don't have more capacity right now to see more patients. We are just saturated. These, uh, this is our priority that we have in the dental clinic. Emergency care, of course, we have to have every day an open chair for all the patients that are in pain. We're trying to change the practice into having appointments for triaging instead of walking in and trying to make them fit in between patients. This has created a lot of confusion, a lot of stress for the patients, for the providers. So we are just opening the appointments. And if they can wait for a day or so, then we can do a better work. There's less stress. We can do a better diagnosis, less pressure. So this has worked very well. Prevention, this is what we want to do, and everybody has talked about it today, about prevention. We definitely spend time talking to the patients. It's not just open the mouth and let me do the work. We want to make sure that we connect to them and that we are able to send a message and they feel respected and they feel that we're helping them. As we have so many issues with these patients, then we have to, most of the time, unfortunately, go into treatment. So we can have basic treatment or we have advanced services. And I'm going to go a little bit into the next one. Everything more or less will go into basic and uh, more complicated, but we definitely want to diagnose. We want to tell patients what the problems are, how to prevent them. Then we do into the fillings or if they need extractions. We kind of do everything in our clinic, as you might think. Um, we have to do limited work. We also follow the dentical guidelines, and we do limited work on crowns. We don't do cosmetics. We definitely want to treat disease, so we stay away from anything that is cosmetic. We do limited root canals. Uh, prostodontics, that's for dentures. We definitely focus on that, and neural surgery. And I decided to put that picture there because we use, we really use nitrous oxide in the clinic. There are a lot of people that are fearful. They don't like this, the, the noise, they don't like the filling. So by using nitrous, definitely we get better outcomes. And I think it's underutilized. I have to put that outside. So if you feel a little bit nervous when you go to the dentist, please ask, can I have nitrous? Yeah. <laughs> I will use it. And the third one, as you might imagine, it's finances. 
everything is very expensive in dentistry. Even if you have your own dental insurance, you go for a cleaning, you go for an exam, and you need a filling, and probably half of your insurance is filled. If you need a crown, you have to pay out of pocket. Imagine patients that don't have any insurance, patients that haven't been to our clinic or any clinic for that matter. They can't afford anything like that. So we have to really help them somehow. At our clinics, we have the sliding um, scale tiers, and this is determined by the federal poverty level guidelines. And um, it's very economical, but even though it's expensive for them, sometimes they cannot pay for all the services, so we focus on treating the disease. And um, if they don't have money, then we Maybe we'll be later. Maybe if it's a homeless person, we don't really charge anything. But we don't really deny any service to anybody. And we, again, on adult patients, we want to focus on preventive. We don't want them only to come when they have pain or they have some problems. The lack, the lack of specialized care is the fourth obstacle that we see. Um, we can do all the procedures in our clinic. We do a lot of surgery, we do a lot of um, dentures, but there, there are cases in which it has, to be, it has to be done by a specialist. So we have community partners in Marin County. We have um, an oral surgeon, Dr. Meisberg, and recently he um, added Dr. Ruggles, and we refer those patients that need general anesthesia. They have a lot of medical issues. The procedures might be really complicated, so we definitely have that uh, partnership, and it has helped us tremendously. We only see them once a month, so we want to make sure that these patients are compliant, that we know that they're going to show up for their appointment, that they understand what's going on. So we are really careful about selecting the patients. For root canals, endodontics, we have Dr. Durham. He's a local endodontist who has offered discounts to our patients. And I think it's very important because people don't want to lose their teeth. Who wants to lose their teeth? So a root canal is about, what, $1,800 right now, $1,500? So we definitely have Dr. Durham who is able to offer a discount. We also have the local schools. We have UCSF. We have UOP. I forgot to also add Highland Hospital, which sees patients on an emergency basis, I think, every day. They have a definitely interesting way of treating the patients, and I just we're going to disclose that. The patients have to call like at 4.30 in the morning or 5 to make an appointment the same day. But still, that's access. It's really, and we have to take advantage of that. So we just emphasize that to the patients that they, they go and get treated. Now, um, transportation. That has been an issue for patients to go to UCSF, UOP, even local, or even sometimes to um, Sonoma, pediatric dental um, initiative. That's where the patients go for general anesthesia, work, dental work. They don't have a way. So we have partnered with Whistle Stop, and we offer rides to the patients. So we have, we have actually done a little bit to help solve the issue. And the last one I put, local dentist, question mark, because right now with the work groups, we're trying to incorporate local dentists to see if they can help us in this crisis. Linda Abrahams, where are you, Linda? Okay, she was here this morning. She is the executive um, director from the Marine Community Dental Society, and um, we're trying to see how we can incorporate private dentists. There are about 200 private dentists, and we do know for sure that they do pro bono cases, they see people, but we wanna have a more structured way. And I think having one centralized person is gonna help us tremendously. Now, um, like we have said all along, we really can work in silos. Every, everything is connected. And we believe in working in an interdisciplinary way. And Marine Community Clinics, we're lucky and we're blessed that we have all many disciplines. So we have expanded our, if you, if you will, our little legs into the medical side. The medical side has also come to us. I want to talk about the medical advocate. This is a physician who goes into the dental side, has a medical assistant, and goes over the schedule of the day and see which patients need any mammogram, maybe lab work, maybe they haven't seen in a while, and that physician has a conversation with the patient. You are due for A, B, C, D, can I help you? So you can imagine that's really, really good service. You could, you could never imagine going to the dental and having a, a medical doctor saying you need A, B, C. So I think we are definitely able to, to close the gap. 
And the access navigator, it's a person who is trained to help the patients with many social issues that they might have. Maybe they have questions. They don't know where to go for specific areas. It could be food. It could be immigration services. And we have that also to help the patients. The OBGYN, definitely we have services. We definitely want to impact these mothers before the, the babies are born. Once the, the babies are born, we want to see them at the time that they have what, the first tooth. So we want to really capture them. And we have a dental advocate for that. And the last one is behavioral health. This is a person that is a licensed social worker who, who was work, who, a person who goes into the dental side when we have patients that have phobias, they have different issues, and when we recognize those, we refer to this dental bravery coach. Sometimes we cannot do work because they are so afraid, or many they have many other issues. And before, because I think I'm running out of time, I want to share with you a story. And this is Gladys. She came in as, a, as an emergency, and she was really crying, and she wasn't doing really well. She was missing front teeth, and she had a denture, but it wouldn't fit. So at the same time, her husband was making fun of her that she didn't have any teeth. So there were a lot of issues going on. And um, our prostodontist, who is the person who does dentures, she saw the problem. She saw that she needed the denture to be fixed, but she also needed some type of support. So she fixed the denture. She was very happy. But at the same time, she made the referral to the dental bravery coach. And she accepted the referral. She went to the coach. Then a few weeks later, she came back and she was happy because she was able to find some emotional support. Her dentures were fixed and she brought her children to be seen. So this is one example of how we can extend our dental work into interdisciplinary approaches. And that's all I have for now. Thank you so much. It takes a village. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Clay Campbell uh, with Marin City Health and Wellness, and I've been the dental director there for five years. Um, let me get logged in here a second. All right, so I was happy to be invited here today. Um, I'm going to give a little bit more kind of subjective view of what I see in the clinic every day. Um, I'm in the clinic four days a week. Uh, Bahar made some very uh, scary statistics earlier, um, so I'm going to stay away from that kind of stuff and uh, just talk about what I see with patients. Um, so we're talking about older adults today. Um, who are the older adults that we see um, in Marin City, which is a, a very, very poor area of Marin? Um, they're losing their teeth. And the, the biggest struggle that I see with adults and, or older adults um, is that they don't, they don't expect to keep their teeth. So. They've seen their grandparents, they've seen their parents, they're all in dentures by the age of 30, and they expect that's what's gonna happen to them. Um, so those struggles that they're looking at, um, number one is motivation at home. Just getting them to get in a routine of cleaning, seeking care, kind of partnering with us to take care of things. Um, making the right nutritional choices. Uh, they struggle with fixed incomes, housing displacement, into life issues. Um, something I hear from a lot of patients is, hey, I only need these teeth for the next five years. What's the point of taking care of them? So I think motivation is really uh, kind of the key in older adults um, and kind of activating them into some sort of community um, that can make some changes in their life. So why are they losing their teeth? Number one reason is gum disease. Um, see a lot, a lot of gum disease. And it's 100% preventable. Um, $2 of floss can fix gum disease. Um, so it really, is a, it really is a problem of more of a psychological basis um, in motivating someone to change how they clean, change their life. Um, so gum disease, you know, number one at home, um, not seeing the dentist enough, not activating that care. Um, it's poorly covered by insurance. So if insurance only covers you to come in for a cleaning 
one time a year. Um, you probably should be seen four times. How are you ever going to catch up? Um, and they also struggle with multiple medications. So we have other health issues. They say if you're on three medications, even if they don't cause dry mouth, um, that activation together causes a lot of dry mouth and leads to a lot of disease. Um, cavities, certainly another thing that we see, um, very high rate, and people don't come in until it hurts. Um, so when you're in pain, it's too late. Um, and you need a root canal, $1,500 on a fixed income is not something that fits into your budget. Um, you end up losing that tooth. I don't think older adults really understand the consequences of losing teeth. Um, you know, we see a lot of patients that come in, they've lost a teeth in their smile. They stop going to everything. So I had a patient that came in, she was like, I'm not going to church until I have new teeth. Well, that's a huge problem if you're not activating in your community anymore. You're now at home, you're not motivated even less to keep things clean, and we get kind of a downward spiral. Um, nutrition is another thing. Um, if I gave you a denture and put a coat of plastic on the roof of your mouth, food doesn't taste the same. So you can't eat these fibrous vegetables anymore, and it's much easier to have chips and processed food. Um, taste is a huge issue. You know, these are things that people actually care about. Um, the health outcomes is something that most people don't think about. So diabetes, huge link with gum disease. Gum disease makes diabetes worse. Diabetes makes gum disease worse. Um, sleep apnea is kind of a silent epidemic. Um, very, very underdiagnosed in the older population. Um, and something that can lead to premature death. Uh, bacteria in your blood. Um, anyone that flosses and sees bleeding, that bacteria is getting into your bloodstream. And we've known for a long time that we found that bacteria in plaques in the heart. Just recently, we're finding that a lot more in amyloid plaques in the brain, contributing to Alzheimer's disease. Um, so how can we help these older adults? Um, and I think, you know, it gets back to motivation. How can we activate people to come in more often and be seen? And that may not be for a dental visit. We may just not be able to get them in that often. We might not have enough providers. Um, and so I think it comes down to kind of activating these other areas. Um, we've worked a lot with our health educator. Um, we have a program where she kind of puts together a, a nutritional meal plan, um, and they talk about that in context of how is this good for my body, how is this good for my teeth. Um, we bring people in to go on hikes, so they come in for diabetes, they go on a hike with the health, health educator, they talk about flossing. You know, when was the last time you flossed? This is how it's contributing to your diabetes. Um, Early interventions, certainly, if we can get people in more often, um, regular cleanings, regular maintenance. Um, I think an increase in later interventions would be helpful as well. Um, kind of having more specialists. You know, we have, we have one endodontist that's agreed to give us a discount on care. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still $1,500, which is not something that's going to fit in a lot of people's budgets. Um, and then at the end of the day, we want to replace those teeth. We want to people, get people back to, uh, back to their smiles, back to their jobs, back to their churches. Um, we want to balance their biting forces in the back. Um, you know, if you lose a back tooth, that may kind of, you know, throw off the whole balance of your bite, causes sleeping issues and other things as well. Um, so I think night guards and sleep apnea appliances is also a focus. But thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Hi, I want to thank you for your um, endurance and attention. 
Hope you can all hear me. Um, I have the good fortune to follow great speakers with um, really important content, and it, you know, we all kind of know this and have a similar thing to say, but I, I thought the presenters were excellent. Um, so I'm going to go off road a little, as we say in the country, and you know, hopefully those who's, who stayed will enjoy this. Um, a little background, um, I came to Coastal Health Alliance in 2013. I had a similar position in a frontier clinic in southwest Colorado, and frontier is defined as less than seven people per square mile. We had 2.5 per square mile, and uh, West Marin, I believe, is about 18 per square mile, which seems like a lot, right? So you know West Marin, all these farms and everything, it's not even close, right? And so also in terms of um, you know, being remote, we were 130 miles from a level three trauma hospital. So um, I took advantage of um, the Stimulus Act the, um, when President Obama first came in and uh, decided to build a dental office, um, which the requirement was uh, to be shovel ready in 120 days, which we did. But can you imagine being shovel ready in Marin County in 120 days? You're lucky if you can you know, get the building department to talk to you. So um, then um, when I hit the ground in 2013, at Coastal Health Alliance, I started going to these West Marin Collaborative monthly meetings, which is awesome safety net group, uh, people that just care about you know, underserved populations. They're coming from all directions. We need dental, we need dental. And I'm going, oh gosh, I just finished a program, right? And so in the same room was Marin Community Foundation. There was this presentation and, and, and you know, when the foundation's in the room, people just see it like, like the cartoon. They, they turn into dollar signs, you know, instead of people. <laughs> and so, um, so Wendy at the time said, where's the data? I said, okay, All right. So I decided to create a real-time um, um, needs assessment, and I got support of Marin County, and um, that's when it started in around 2014. So we did a private-public partnership with the local dentist in Point Reyes Station, who you know some people thought was kind of at the end of his career. He's, he's still there, and v very old office. And we got to staff it two days a week, and uh, they weren't consecutive days. So every day, staff had to come in, take away his stuff, put our stuff in place, and then we started seeing people. And oh, equipment would break down. Uh, we wouldn't have a backup for staffing. Staffing is going to be a recurring issue here anyway. Um, and so, but in, immediately we created data and the need was apparent and people started coming. So my luck, luck number one, was from the time I started thinking about it to the time we launched it, California brought back Denical. So without that, we probably wouldn't be here, right? So um, we, we kind of um, outgrew this. And we decided, because of the lack of bricks and mortar and how difficult it is to build and all the complicated things in West Marin, which is more complicated than the whole county because the Coastal Commission likes to get involved as well, um, we, we, we ordered, uh, well, I, I'll take responsibility. I ordered a custom-made um, custom dental van that was made in Riverside. It was over three months late. And I paid staff for three months, so I couldn't lose them, who really did nothing. And um, when, the, when the manufacturer said, it's time to pick it up, I said, I'm coming down to get it. And so if it, he said it was going to be done on a Tuesday, I left Riverside on a Friday. That's me. <laughs> and then um, uh, that same night, um, I arrived to Point Race Station. Oh, I drove it 500 miles. It's 39 feet long. Um, I arrived to Point Reyes Station uh, at 2 in the morning, and um, it was a long drive. <laughs> and so, but there it is set up. And I just take a look at the stairs, because we're going to talk about that in a second. So the pop out is the sterilization area. And then that's fully expanded. We have a, a, a wheelchair lift and um, you know, little awnings. It's kind of a nice RV, right? And this is pristine. This is the inside. Um, two chairs. And it's really, a, it's really a very functional space. It's just that the staff has to dance a bit and like each other because it's, it's very tight. It's something like um, nine feet wide by 24 feet long. That's it. That's the whole deal, right? 
And you can see some, you know, we're set up, we have sterilization and little rolly carts and two chairs and now we have chair side monitors and, you know, there's an x-ray arm in there and stuff like that. So it's really been very functional, very helpful, and it launched the program into first a four-day, then a five-day program. That, the waiting room chair still has plastic on it. This is an early shot. So the reason I included this slide is, on the right is Dr. Ramirez, who's um, our dentist, and he's really helped build the program, um, really helped to build trust. And those are the Millerick brothers who are boat builders from Sevastopol, who are the only people I could find to make an aluminum landing because people were almost falling out of the thing. There was no landing. And when you walk up the stairs, the door opened out and then you'd have to back up. And it's some really old people going up there. So I have to say, I'm so glad in about the year that it took me to figure this out. Nobody fell off the stairs. <laughs> and then, um, yes, we do provide oral health care in Bolinas. So we would, but it's not, it's part time. So, you know, just to kind of, uh, just to help the community, I would drive it down to Bolinas about four times a year. I'd have to show up at the end of the day after we button everything up and then pull in at night. That's, that's a real, you know, my own cell phone photo. And then we level it and set it up and, um, have to work off of a generator and, um, we have Wi Fi with our network onto our, main clinic site, back in Point Reyes, we have a shoreline, so we plug in and we don't need the generator. So we did go there. One, this time uh, we went there, we were there for four days and two days uh, last winter were the biggest storms to hit West Marin in the entire year. It knocked out our, our wireless connection. Um, it was just, you know, we lost a lot of productivity. <laughs> Can you imagine, right? And then this is our collaboration with the fire department when somebody left a 12 volt thing on and the battery went dead. So they have a charger that we snaked under the thing and charged it and got it. Dr. Campbell is laughing because he understands, right? Um, and so, um, and then a little data. This is my only data, data chart. And you can see from the years, the first year in 15, we were open six months. We went to nine months, we went to a year. And the things I looked at was the increase in uninsured patients, uninsured visits, total patients, that's the whole program, uh, total visits. And you see total visits dropped in 2018, although uncompensated care went up. Um, that's because we really help people who are uninsured and even uh, on the sliding fee scale, um, we have a very low copay. And then um, if, if, if things aren't covered by Medi-Cal, then we offer a, um, uh, a really large uh, prompt pay discount. And we're trying to get everyone who needs care. And I mean, the middle class is afraid of dental, of oral health. It's just not just underserved populations. Everyone becomes underserved when it comes to dental care. And um, the reason that we dropped in productivity is because of the dental assistant shortage that um, has hit us all. And I had two out of five days a week where I did not have any dental assistant and a dentist was trying to do everything themselves. There's times now when we have two to one, but you know the productivity is just not there, but we kept the program going. Um, and since then we've started growing our own dental assistants because they're not out there. So um, we, we had one that was a referral from a staff member and she trained up and she's fine. Now she has her x-ray certification and, you know, basic stuff. We have another dental assistant that ended up going and getting her RDA while working for us who now is in school to become a dentist. And she actually is the only one living in Point Reyes that we have and the, the others travel around. And recently we were having trouble. So we said, okay, we told the staff $500 bonus if you refer someone. Wow names fell out of the sky. It was amazing, right? And so we ended up with two, we have two more candidates because as I explained, as I will explain, we're gonna expand and we have to have dental assistants. So there's really more dentists out there than dental assistants, which is strange, but true, right? I don't know what the schools are doing, but they're not reading the market. So then outreach, how are we gonna, how are we gonna sell the program? And so this was Western Weekend, and um, was there a pointer on this? Is that what this is? Yeah. yeah. Um, s these are um, longhorns. 
that my wife made for, for, as a hood ornament for the Western Weekend Parade. And um, she's a faux painter. And, and, and um, so I had, I was driving. I had a tough couple of kids in it. This is more outreach. And then we had tooth fairies that um, ended up giving out um, toothbrushes and toothpaste and floss. And I don't know if anybody knows Point Reyes, but there's the gas station. And then if you head what direction is south, like going through town, and you pass by the bank, which is the first building, and then the parade went all through town. By the time they hit the tree after the bank, 250 bags of dental goodies were just evaporated. People came in them. So, you know, that was pretty cool. Um, and so those are the Latina tooth fairies, and then we have the Anglo tooth fairies. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> You know, we want to represent our whole community. <laughs> um, so this is a graphic representation of what Reba was talking about. Um, I made these teeth. I made good teeth and bad teeth. Now, you can't see on the right, the tooth fairy in pink is Paloma. And she has a huge toothbrush. And she is brushing the good tooth. And we also used kind of rope as floss in front of the um, judges, you know, who <laughs> weren't even listening. and then. The, the tooth, the bad tooth, if you see, is getting drilled by two nine-year-old boys who had the most fun, right? <laughs> they drove in the truck, too. It was like, this was it for them. And so if you notice the 16-ounce bottle of Coke, it may be a 20, but so I looked it up today. A 16-ounce bottle of Coke is 52 grams of sugar, is over 12 teaspoons of sugar. How can they fit that in the bottle and you don't see it? You know, it's just amazing. So I know a, a physician could answer that question, I'm sure. But, um, and then there's gummy worms um, going in and out of the bad tooth, as you see. And... I don't know if you see a big, big hunk on the right there. Let me see, where are we? Right around here is a big hunk. So what I learned about big hunk is that it's gluten-free. And I didn't know that before. So that's, a, anyway, this is an outreach event. So we, um, we're out, we've outgrown the dental van. It's, um, it, it served us well. It's really productive, and it's meant to be driven, and it's meant to go off-site. And um, we're going to talk to Marine Community Clinic and whoever is interested in what the next home should be for the dental van. But it is, it, I mean, it helps with what we talked about in terms of the um, in-reach into schools and stuff. You know, instead of just sending a chair, send the whole vehicle there. And if you need to do restorative work, it's totally self-contained. It can do it. So um, we'll work on that. And... Yeah, we launched um, this project in August. Um, we're going to open the first week in April. I found the dream contractors, and they're on time, and everything's happening, and um, I'm just pretty excited about it. So back to the, the needs assessment, the original one, was funded by Marin County, actually, Supervisor Kinsey found a way. The dental van, the main funders were... Marin Community Foundation, Marin County, First Five, thank you, and Kaiser Community Benefits. Those were the main funders in our own, uh, in our own donor list. The, this project so far has been funded by Marin County with the IGT funds, um, Marin Community Foundation, and our own donors. That's it so far. So. Um, it's not too late to be invited to our donor opening, so just go on coastalhealth.net if you'd like to do that, and you will be invited to our opening party. <laughs> and uh, let me see. Where is this going to be? Where, What's wrong? Where, where are you? Where is this going to be built? Where, are, where is this? Yeah. Good question. Um, there, we rent. We just got a 10-year lease in the livery stable, which is shares um, a, a lawn with Cowgirl Creamery. So you can get subsidized dental care, then buy $30 a pound cheese right next door if you want to. That would, that's cool. Um, OK, so this, is, this was actually Thursday. And now this is all painted. This is the reception and the waiting room. And we're going to have four chairs. And you know it's going to be set up really nice. Um, and I think I'm making this, I'll make this pretty short. So 
we're about ready to wrap up, we, so we don't lose people. Sorry to. Who said that? I did. Oh. I'm sorry, but you mean I, we don't want to miss our closing. You're taking me off the. I'm encouraging to wrap up. Okay, I'll wrap up. Here's my final statement, and that is. I'm looking forward to the day that oral health, rather than being an adjunct, is acknowledged and seamlessly integrated into overall health. Evidence-based, equitable, integrated health isn't, um, is, is what we're looking for. So I looked up the word naive, showing a lack of experience, wisdom, or judgment. I don't think we're naive here. I think we're just up against a huge dis dysfunction. And when this, this free market chaos that we live in gives way to a true health system, I'm going to be a happy guy. I got one more. Slide. Let's see if this works. Do you know how I launched this? I think you sent a PDF, so I don't think that's going to. No, it was a, a video. <laughs> but I it's embedded in a PDF, is what she's saying. So, it, but uh, I can send it to everyone. I can't do it. Okay, well that's know. it. Thanks. It was a good slide. <laughs> see ya. <laughs> Thank you. So after hearing about all the great stuff that's happening, I know you all want to get involved, right? So the next slide, I hope, is coming up here. There we go. Great. So those work groups that we talked about, there are three. Uh, communication work group is dealing with communication strategies and data and evaluation. So that's a, a great place to join if you're interested. The education work group is focusing on promoting oral health through education. Access work group, um, increasing access to oral health and increasing or reducing disparities to oral health. So these are the three work groups. And when you fill out your evaluation, there's an area where you can say what you would like to do if you'd like to participate. And one other area is the advisory committee. So that committee is looking at guiding and overseeing the implementation process um, of oral health plan and evaluating and staying connected to other oral health professionals. So those are ways to be involved. And again, all of this is on our website, um, www.marinoralhealth.org. And Jennifer has a story for us to wrap up, because we all love stories. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So in closing, I've been asked to share a success story, um, which just kind of reiterates how important all of our work is here in oral health. And this story is from a few years ago, but it has just always stayed with me. And I was doing a screening out in West Marin, and I saw a little boy who ended up having some major decay and an abscess. And I worked with the family advocate at the school there, and we were able to get a hold of his family and get him in for an emergency visit that afternoon and then a follow-up dental appointment the next day, which was really exciting because that was really fast turnaround. And the next day, I was back at the school, and the boy's father came in to thank me for being there. He said that his son had actually missed school earlier in the week. He wasn't feeling well, and his dad thought that maybe he just had a flu or something else going on. And then he started crying as he told me that the last year had been extremely rough on their family as they had lost his wife and the boy's mom to cancer. And in that year, it had been very, very hard for him to enforce good eating habits or even just regular oral health care routines. And he was just so extremely thankful that somebody had come in to where his son was um, and, and found this. They even had a dentist in their family that they were able to go to, but life had just been way too hard. So we never know what's going on with people in their personal lives or why they may be neglecting some of their oral health care at home. Um, and so that's why what we do is just so important in bringing all of the access to the people in our county. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us and for your patience for hanging in there um, till noon. I just wanted to invite you to um, our uh, next meetings on March 18th. We're going to have um, a wonderful uh, forum on autism and it'll be a, a broad introduction for all of, the, all of us who work with children and families. 
on April 8th, we're going to be looking at child care and how important affordable and high quality child care is for children, for working families, and for their employers. And then on May 20th, we're for Mental Health Awareness Month, we're going to be um, having a forum on toxic stress and the impacts on uh, lifelong health. And we have some really great panels. It'll be interactive session and hope you can join us. Thanks very much.